Today's episode of the Nick Taylor Horror Show is brought to you by Diabolic DVD. For almost 20 years, Diabolic DVD has been the source for horror, cult, and weird cinema to customers around the world. Diabolic offers a one-stop shopping experience for all of your favorite labels, including Arrow, Synapse, Vinegar Syndrome, Severin, Mondo Macabro, Blue Underground, 88, and many more from all corners of the globe. So whether you're looking for the definitive version of Suspiria or trying to upgrade your crusty old DVD of Cannibal Holocaust, Diabolic is the owner-operated small business choice you've been craving. Shop online at DiabolicDVD.com. That's D-I-A-B-O-L-I-K DVD.com. We're also brought to you by Deadly Grounds Coffee. It's the number one choice of horror fans worldwide. Nothing starts your day or night better than a delicious cup of Deadly Grounds. Whether you're hunting ghosts or fighting the next zombie apocalypse, any one of Deadly's 30-plus roasts will bring you to caffeine nirvana with the richest flavor you've ever had. Whether you're craving their hellhound roast, witch's brew, devil's night roast, or sinful delight, order online at getdeadly.com for easy and safe shipping right to your door. We know that once you go deadly, you won't go back. Join the deadly revolution today. Be bold, be different, be deadly. Deadly Grounds Coffee. Coffee to die for and zombie approved. Get some at getdeadly.com. Welcome to the Nick Taylor Horror Show. Lowell Dean is a Canadian writer and director, perhaps best known for his lycanthropic cult classic, Wolf Cop, and its sequel, Another Wolf Cop. Usually I'm not a fan of movies that intentionally embrace campiness, but Wolf Cop is an entirely different animal. Well written, well acted, great effects, lots of laughs, and overall a lot of fun and unmissable. Wolf Cop really has the spirit of the Midnight Monster movie and actually is the closest thing in spirit I've seen to Rob Zombie's grindhouse concept, Werewolf Women of the SS, which I'm still anxiously awaiting in vain along with Eli Roth's Thanksgiving. In any case, perhaps the best way to see Wolf Cop is on season one of The Last Drive-In with Joe Bob Briggs, now streaming on Shudder. Lowell and I talked about the making of Wolf Cop, his director origin story, and major lessons learned from low-budget horror and filmmaking on this episode of the Nick Taylor Horror Show. Now, without further ado, here is director Lowell Dean. Lowell Dean, great to see you. How's everything going? Good, good. Nice to be here. Good, good. So, I mean, been a big fan of yours for a while. And I feel like one of the uh, one of the interesting things about Wolf Cop in the context of 2020 is uh, it was one of the first exploding dicks I've seen, and there's been <laughs> there's been multiple exploding dicks in movies in 2020. I don't want to spoiler alert what the movies are, but those who have seen them know what I'm talking about. So I, feel I like watched you... one yesterday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I know which one. Uh, it's on Shutter, right? Yes, it is. Yep, yes. I know the one. I interviewed the director. But uh, <laughs> so you're the kind of exploding dick ambassador for the horror world. But um, a good title. <laughs> so as far as as far as Wolf Cop, some some very respectable transformation sequences. You know, I mean, just want to dive in by talking about practical effects. I mean, what was your what was your approach to the effects in this movie and the overall contribution to the werewolf genre? Um, I, I mean. It's it's I've said this story before, but it is bears repeating because it is, uh, you know, about the practicality of low budgets and what you have to do when you don't have a lot of resources. And uh, myself and the practical effects artist Emerson Ziffel, you know, we were just kind of spitballing um, blue sky at first. Like what, you know, I when I had the script, I just said crazy transformation. And I said, now let's actually sit down and, and figure out what that's going to be obviously inspired by uh, American Werewolf in London mm-hmm. as like the, the pinnacle. Right. Right. Um, so uh, basically I, I, I remember being in a coffee shop with Emerson one day and really storyboarding out the first transformation and what the scenes were going to be. It wasn't how it started. It wasn't the dick first at all. It was just like every classic shot you'd want to do, you know, like we went body part by body part. I'm like, I obviously want to see the eyes turning. I want to see uh, claws coming out of his hand. Um, you know, and it was like a long list, like of 15 shots. And then I, I said to Emerson, okay, now what's the reality here? Like break down for me, 
what it's going to take to do each of these shots. And he did the math and um, it was over a day to do it. And I knew that talking to RAD, we were going to be lucky if we had honestly half a day to do the transformation. So uh, I jokingly said, we have time for four shots. So they better be the ones that, you know, we've never seen before. And then, you know, I don't even know if we said it out loud. We're just like, dick, you know, that, <laughs> so that, that would happen. Just the reality of like, we won't be able to do a bunch of shots. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Yeah. And thanks for not making it like a, a, a red dog boner. That would have been too hard to see. <laughs> oh, we have a lot that hit the cutting room floor. Oh, really? Like, I think my first cut was like a two minute long, like very painful to watch sequence. And the producers are like, we don't want an X rating, you know, so <laughs> they trimmed it back as far as they could. And even to this day, in my mind, I still see all the shots we did. We had like three different dick puppets. So oh, Wow. It was a weird day on set. For sure. Was there a specific title for the Dick Puppeteer? Was that uh, is that in the cast somewhere? I didn't I didn't look you know, for it, but should I? No, no, it was it was Emerson. Emerson uh, puppeteered the dicks himself, but I, I do remember it was. That's good for the LinkedIn profile. <laughs> it's the kind of thing that when you're actually there doing it, you 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 have those thoughts like, have I done? Uh, have I made a horrible mistake? You know, when you actually are there on set and people are. <laughs> Puppeteering it one dick through another one. You're like, why are we doing this? My mother must be so proud. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) So, how did the movie get off the ground? I mean, I know that you had, you did an Indiegogo, which was very successful, but um, I mean, could you just walk us through the process for, uh, for, for, getting for, for getting wolf cup made you know overall want to go over your overall career history but um what was it like getting wolf cup off the ground because very outlandish very fun concept you know not necessarily something you can take on the water bottle tour yeah no uh for sure and and a lot of those things that drew me to it were uh as you mentioned the practical effects i, I just really wanted to make a practical effects monster movie and one thing i remember at the time you know, I'm not attributing all of it to this necessarily, but I remember the werewolf of note uh, Mm -hmm. when I was writing it was Twilight. And I remember I was just so frustrated that like it was, you know, not that it was like a a young adult teen love story. That's fine by me. But I I just remember like it was like a CGI wolf. And and I just remember thinking like, ah, this isn't, this isn't my werewolf, you know, like my generation werewolf. I, I wanted the old, like the Lon Chaney Wolfman. I wanted American Werewolf. I even wanted Teen Wolf. I wanted a, an actual person in a suit walking around doing stuff, you know? So I think that was a huge factor for me. And uh, so, you know, I had a good group of people in Saskatchewan, like a little army of, of film people who all wanted to make a movie and uh, kind of inspired by. Uh, how Sam Raimi tried to get Evil Dead off the ground, you know, by like doing some concept stuff and finding rich people <laughs> to yeah. finance it. You can talk uh, to dentists. Exactly. Yes, that was that honestly was our goal. So uh, the first thing we did is we everybody volunteered, and with about four grand Canadian, we made a uh, proof of concept trailer, which looks better to this day, I think, than the film itself because <laughs> it was like a paragraph description that we shot over two days with a full crew. Um, so so we did that and. Uh, like I said, my, my goal was, um, let's find rich people to finance this. I knew it would sell because when I told people the name, every single person who I told it to, and this isn't one or two, it's like at least a dozen. When I told them that, that became all I was to them for the next year. You know, Wolf like, I, guy. I, yeah, they'd be like, Wolf Cobb, you know, so I, you got to make that movie. So, um, I knew it was a sticky enough idea that people would want to, you know, maybe get behind it. So we did the trailer. And then uh, there was something called Cineku in Canada, which is kind of like American Idol for filmmaking. Mm-hmm. And uh, basically, it, it kind of dovetailed with what we are doing perfectly at the time. And what they wanted was, um, I think it was like an online platform where you had to pitch your film ideas and uh, anybody across Canada could enter. And so the only condition is you had to have a script and you had to have a proof of concept trailer. So we entered thinking we probably didn't have a shot because Canada isn't necessarily known for making like, I mean, in the seventies and and such, it was known for making these kinds of movies, but the reputation of note at the time was a little more highbrow maybe. Uh, But we're like, what the hell, what do we have to lose? So we entered and uh, after three months of selling our soul, uh, basically on online and, and pitching and begging uh, we were selected. So that's kind of how the movie got off the ground. Very, very cool. So, I mean, when it came to, I feel like a lot of filmmakers or aspiring filmmakers um, 
they read about Sam Raimi and pitching rich people and pitching dentists and things like that. What do you prepare for them in order to show that their money is going to come back, that they are going to make money off of your movie? I feel like it's something a lot of filmmakers just overlook. And I feel like the other thing a lot of filmmakers don't consider is the sales element. Like you do have to have some sort of a marketing plan for your movie. You have to somehow showcase what the market looks like, whether it's, oh, this genre is doing well. or So, I mean, what was in like financial terms, was there any sort of, what was your preparation like in, in selling the movie from a financial standpoint? Uh, honestly, very little. <laughs> like we had, uh, we had like a one sheet made up and we, uh, you know, at the time uh, went online and found examples of films um, in our budget range. And then what they did, you know, the best, obviously just the best case scenario ones, mm-hmm. like we could blow up like this, you know, you could have the next paranormal activity on your hands if you uh, give just this amount of money. So I mean, I think it is amalgamous, and I think people often keep a lot of those facts and details behind closed doors um, yeah. intentionally just to kind of keep it uh, elusive. Um, I I rarely encourage anyone I know to invest in my movies just because I want to maintain friendships. And uh, right. you know, financing is a tricky thing. That said, um, I, don't, I don't know any filmmaker who hasn't put their own blood and sweat and financial equity into um, projects, whether they like it or not. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like this is a really good key. I mean, as you're as as a filmmaker, you're as you build up a network, you don't always necessarily want to hit up that network for your financing, even if you're networked with high, uh, pro- highly profitable individuals. It's definitely something to think about unless you have, you know, the next paranormal activity in your hands. I don't know. But it, it's a tr- it sounds like, a you know, a tricky conundrum. Oh, yeah. I, I don't um, envy producers at all. I think it's especially more and more. Uh, I, I see it. I see the writing on the wall. It's getting so hard to finance indie films. Uh, films to me that seem like no brainers uh, with the kind of transition to streamers. It seems very interesting in, in what is a safe bet anymore. And what I find most disheartening is uh, the budget drops of these films. You mm-hmm. know, like five years ago, uh, you know, playing in the what I consider to be low budget range of a million dollars, you know, 1.5 to two even. Um, I feel like I just don't want to go any lower than that for, I'm still not getting the quality I want at that budget level. Um, and it's partly the kinds of stuff I do, but also then, then now you now flash forward to now and you're meeting producers who are like, I'd love to see what you could do with 200 grand. I'm like, Thanks. Yeah, I wouldn't, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but that's cause to me, like who's making money on that? Like if it's, if they are, it's a pyramid and it's a very few amount of people who are making money off the backs of a lot of really passionate, maybe dumb people. Yeah. 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 I know it's, it's a very confusing world, but uh, you know, it's an inevitable thing that filmmakers have to deal with. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things I love most about Wolf Cop is usually movies that there's a, there's a whole kind of subgenre of, uh, of horror that is kind of campy for the sake of campy. And at first glance, Wolf Cop may seem that way, but it's sharply written. It's really funny. It's fun. It's just like of quality. It doesn't feel like, you know, a script that was written in a weekend, like some of these movies feel like, you know, and they, 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 they feel like there's this almost, it's almost like insulting when you see some of those movies, like you give them a chance and you want them to be entertaining, but you can just tell they put no effort into the script whatsoever. But Wolf Cop seems like clearly conceptually it's so outlandish, but there's a level of serious quality to it and serious fun to it. So, I mean, I'm curious about entering that world of camp while delivering the goods. Cause it's, it's unexpectedly, you know, good and fun considering it's, it seems to echo that subgenre, but it's not part of it. And so, uh, I mean, in terms of, in terms of all of that, how did you structure the the overall story and where it fit in terms of its genre or subgenre? Uh, that's a really good question, and and thank you for uh, noticing the quality or attempted quality. I think like <laughs> what's funny is when it was called Wolf Cop, I knew that I was I didn't realize until kind of after that it was in a way shooting myself in the foot because there's no way. I mean, on the one hand, I think it makes it critic proof because mm-hmm. it's so dumb. But the problem was uh, the contradiction that I didn't just want to phone it in, you know, like I kept telling people even on set, like our job is that they come in the theater thinking this is going to be the dumbest thing I ever see. And my hope and goal was they'd walk up being like, wow, that was actually better than it should have been. Right. Um, And so we were always aiming for like cinematic as possible within our budget um, as good effects as possible within our budget. Um, And, and yes, like I love puns. I love wit. 
Um, I, I kind of grew up with things like the Adam West Batman and, oh, yeah. uh, you know, so I, 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 I'm a comic nerd as much as I'm a horror nerd. So for me, I really saw this as a superhero origin story. And I thought like, let's embrace uh, the locale. Let's embrace Saskatchewan, but let's show it in maybe kind of the scuzziest, worst possible light and kind of lean into like the backwoods nature of it and, and just have fun with it, you know? So yeah. that, that, I mean, that was it. Like really just like a commitment to bad puns um, and, and a comic book style, but not ever phoning anything in. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's a critical error for a lot of horror filmmakers is they, they don't really convey to the actors. You have to take this really seriously, you know? Yeah. And I feel like a lot of actors get on set of a horror movie um, and think that like, eh, it's a horror movie it has a certain level of cheesiness to it, but not doing that, not making your actors take it seriously is, is such a kiss of death for so many. We you know, would it's be so great. sure you say that I, I think tone um, I considered that to be my biggest job on those films was obviously being a cheerleader for everybody. Um, but, but more than anything, uh, being like the tone police. Mm. And I won't, I will be very honest uh, while we were shooting it, there were moments where um, I have very vivid memories of having that feeling in my gut of like, I jumped the shark. This is too stupid. Mm. Uh, so what I would do in those moments would be very honestly say to the actors, do it again, much bigger. And then we're going to do another one. That's no reaction. Uh, Cause I, I don't know now I'm saying, honestly, I don't know now. And I wanted to decide in the edit um, so I can ride the tonal wave, you know, because like I knew I wanted to kind of start serious and then kind of unravel into chaos. Yeah. Um, so, but, but I mean, you, when you shoot a movie like this out of order, you don't really know. So um, I, multiple scenes, I have versions that are high ridiculousness. And then ones that, like you said, were dead serious dramas and, and honestly, a lot of that came down to the casting too. And when I would watch tapes, um, I got all variety of of performance for characters like Tina and Willie. I got people who treated Willie like Shakespearean serious, and I had characters who were like, you know, uh, the Drew Carey show or, or, or Kramer <laughs> yeah. slamming through a doorway and like screaming, you know. So it was finding the the right people. At, at least as best as possible who were already there. That's interesting. And it sounds like you largely found the, the tone in post. I mean, clearly you went on set with a real good conception of what the tone was, but it sounds like you were still developing it throughout the course oh. of the movie, you know, and these yeah. things evolve, you know, I mean, I'm sure there's, there's the movie you have in your head. There's the movie you shoot then there's the one that you edit, but um, yeah, it's interesting that you, you, you mostly found the tone in post. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Like um, I would, I would say like, I don't know statistically what it was percent wise, but there was, I, I have very vivid memories. Like I said, of certain scenes where I was like, I think this is too silly. I yep. think this is the moment that I'd check out. So let's just bear with me and everybody do one without any emotion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I feel like it, that raises a really interesting point about working with actors, particularly in a movie that is as specific a tone as Wolf Cop is, even if on set you don't exactly know what the tone is, communicating that to the actors, like, hey, I don't exactly know what we're going for, but I'll know it when I see it. So let's try this, 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 and this. You know, I feel like the worst thing a director can do is pretend to have all the answers, but instead, I feel like it's mostly a matter of conveying that we're all here to find the answers together. And, you know, as you steer the ship and and I think kind of showing your cards to the actors in that regard, in terms of like, hey, we're still figuring this out, so let's work on it together and workshop it. It just feels like it's so smart, you know, to make a movie like this work. Well, and what was fun about it was the tone um, wasn't the same for everyone. You know what I mean? I think yeah. that's sometimes what makes movies like these work or not work. And so I do also remember certain actors getting frustrated that, um, you know, I would say to some like, well, how come, you know, or they'd say, how come this person gets to go off and say anything in their mind or <laughs> improvise or make jokes? And I'm like, because he's, you know, that's who he is. He's in this movie. You're not in the same movie. Unfortunately, you are one of the characters who's in the, the dead serious drama. So right. uh, you're not going to partake in any of the chaos. I'm sorry, but you legitimize what they're doing. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So everybody does have a purpose. <laughs> so m making a movie like this, you were on very, it was a low budget, comparatively low budget, and you didn't have a ton of time. Uh, were there any major obstacles or any days when it was just Murphy's law and things went majorly wrong and you really had to pull a rabbit out of a hat as a director to, you know, either get the shot or get something done on time or on budget. I mean, what were some of the difficulties in getting this movie made on set? Uh, I, I wish I could pull out a spreadsheet because every day was that, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, literally any possible thing you could imagine. Um, we had 
Um, and I would say by the time we got to Wolf Cop 2, it was even crazier and worse, but we were attempting bigger things. So, mm. But on the first film, no, I mean, uh, we were shooting scenes and then having uh, winter storms that literally meant that continuity was going to be out of whack and we'd have to either reshoot or reframe how we shoot other scenes. Um, shooting a lot of outdoor stuff, you know, like we thought we'd be making the movie in summer, but like many indie films, our schedules pushed and pushed until literally the very verge of a Saskatchewan winter, which is not something you want to be Whoa. outside in. And because it wasn't written for that, we had characters who weren't allowed to be in big jackets, you know, like Leo Fafardi plays Wolf Cop at one point is literally chained to a tree in just his work police shirt. And it's like minus 30. So, Ooh. and I'm like, I'm, I'm like, I can't rewrite this. Um, luckily, he's a tough son of a bitch. But, uh, you know, those are the kinds of things I say, weather, schedule, uh, losing locations, um, just every little thing, uh, you know, effects problems, uh, things that are just every filmmaker deals with, I'm sure. But um, because Wolf Cop was not technically my first film, but emotionally, mm. you know, everyone kind of is a gut punch. Yeah. So is there any key to being able to get through all of those obstacles as a uh, as a director? I mean, it wasn't your first rodeo, clearly, but it seemed like it was your most important movie at the time. So what were some of the keys to, to kind of riding through those rough waters? Well, it's a cliche, but like I really, really, really believe in preparation. Yeah. Um, uh, I am someone who will shot list the entire film and anything that's even remotely confusing like an action scene or a practical effects transformation or even a car chase or anything remotely out of the norm of two people talking, um, I will storyboard. And I think like that is important. And of course you deviate from that on a 17 mm -hmm. day shoot because you don't have the luxury to be like, all right, everyone shots one through three, you know, it, it just, you get punched in the face repeatedly, but what that preparation does um, is it, uh, it kind of locks in your brain what's important and what's crucial. Right. And um, I find the best lesson I learned over the years is to communicate everything that's in your head. And even if it seems obvious, there hasn't been a single time where I've been on set saying something an hour before I need it. And I see one person's eyes light up and they run out of the room because only in me saying it in that moment, uh, they realized it. And now I don't have to wait for it an hour later, you know? So um, but I mean, honestly, it's unavoidable that things will go wrong. So what I also do is not just have a plan A of like, this is what I want my dream scenario with my shot list and my storyboard. Um, I also have backup plans, right? So um, for every single scene, whether it's the night before I'm shooting or months before, I come up with a plan A, B, C, and sometimes even D if I know I'm going to be in a real tight spot. And uh, a really good example, I think, of, of that is um, in another Wolf Cop, the sequel, we were doing a, a fight scene. And, you know, it's a movie littered with chaos and gags and fight scenes. So I really got in the habit of telling every department, um, whatever this, is, with this gag is or this fight is, I need multiple versions because we want, obviously, everybody wants the version where we have multiple hours to shoot it. But, uh, for example, we had a fight scene in a hockey rink and... Um, the stunt coordinator, Sean Skeen, was working with the actors and they were planning it and prep and figuring out all the beats like a choreographed dance. But I said to them, okay, now, obviously, we all want this, but there is a chance, as we all know from making the first Wolf Cop, that I could come to you and say, we have 15 minutes to shoot this four-hour fight scene. So because of that, I want you now to be armed with that knowledge and I want you to come up with not just our dream fight, but if I told you, sorry, you have 15 minutes, what would you do? What parts would you cut out? And um, the best thing that came out of that was the lack of time that we lost on set, you know? Mm -hmm. Because sure enough, on Wolf Cop 2, come day 16, uh, I had to cut that great fight scene into 15 minutes uh, of our shoot. And because we knew it, and because the stunt coordinator and the actors had prepared versions of that, like almost like a different dance, uh, we lost no time. I just made eye contact, I said, I'm sorry, it's version D and they immediately snapped into action. They said, camera here, camera here, this version, this camera will get these angles and it'll miss these, but this camera angle will cover it. And we got a pretty decent fight scene, 15 minutes, which I don't advocate for or recommend every given. <laughs> but when you're in those tight spots, you know, like to me, that was a moment where even though I was kind of screwed over, uh, you know, in terms of what I wanted to do, I actually felt a bit of pride because I'm like, we would have, on a regular day, we would have just cut this fight scene and lost it. And now we still got it. 
I feel like that's huge. And I feel like what that speaks to is, yeah, a lot of directors talk about the importance of preparation, but what they don't talk about uh, is the importance of communicating your, your, your backup plans to the, your, your cast and crew so that you don't lose precious time on set. I mean, I mean, it's amazing that you, you knew that there had to be, you know, obviously best case scenario, you have the four hours to shoot the fight scene, but the way that the day could go is you may have 15 minutes and, you communicated that to your stunt coordinator. So when it came, when the shit hit the fan and you only had 15 minutes, they didn't panic. You didn't lose that time on set. They didn't have to regroup with everybody and okay, shit, I'll, somehow we'll figure this out, which, you know, will happen. But the fact that you, you had prepared him for that, I feel like that that's, that's so smart. And it seems like it's so the name of the game, you know, plan or you hope for the best, but plan for the worst, but you can't just do that in your own head. You have to cue everybody into your backup plans. Yeah, and I, I think I, you know, I came by that lesson honestly, probably because on an earlier film I, I didn't communicate, and then when we went to do the thing, it took me the fifteen minutes to explain what we could do, and then mm. we're like, "Sorry, that's the buzzer," you know. So yeah, um, sometimes you learn these lessons the hard way, uh, and sometimes you don't. And and you know, it's like anything: the more you do it, the more you kind of can ebb and flow with it. And like I said, you see the problems coming, and uh, communication will save your life. So one thing that I thought was was really interesting that I've not seen is the the wolf cop makeup was very felt like it was very much like an homage to the Lon Chaney makeup in the original Wolfman, which we just I, I can't name any other movie that's done that except for obviously, you know, the Hammer movies and other derivative movies. But this seemed to be the first time that that makeup was just very proudly homaged. And that was very intentional, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I sat down with Emerson Ziffel, the uh, effects artist, and we really looked at movies. And, and uh, I, I talked about my desire for it to be a man in a suit, you know. Um, so he looked at all different styles. Um, you know, like I said, a big influence actually was Teen Wolf. We're mm-hmm. like, that's too silly. Uh, we looked at the Benicio del Toro, more recent Wolfman, and and there were some things he really liked in there. But um, I left a lot of that to Emerson. I, I I wasn't even like he's got to be brown or gray or black or anything like that. It was just like, what do you think works best for Leo? And and luckily we got to do our concept trailer, so that kind of served as um, an unofficial makeup test. So what was cool was even on the day I remember the very first time he was Leo was ever in makeup uh, for that trailer. I think we like wasted the first twenty minutes of our our day like just like walking around and looking at him and poking at his ears <laughs> and being like. It's okay for now, but I don't like his eyes or these ears should be up higher. You know, like we'll shoot it and it doesn't matter. But like when we do the actual movie, let's do these things. So, Mm. uh, yeah, we definitely lots of influences. So what was your overall directorial origin story? How did you kind of break through? What was how how did you end up making your first movie and what what was your overall background? Um, I have, I think, probably a very common uh, story for for directors of my age. Um, you know, raised in the 80s, uh, VHS camcorders running around shooting fight scenes uh, with my friends, freaking my parents out because I'm using ketchup as blood and having <laughs> severed hands, you know. Right. Uh, to the day, there's a stain on my parents' kitchen ceiling because I, I was attempting to test squibs. Nice. Uh, so, so that, you know, a, a lot of, I always knew I wanted to be a director, but in hindsight, it's obvious the kind of films I'd make. But at the time, it was all just experimentation and play. Mm-hmm. And uh, then you get older and you kind of grow up or you should. And uh, I couldn't decide what to do in university. And my uh, my dad really wanted me to be an engineer. And I was like, I don't think I you know, could do that to save my life if I wanted to. And the only thing I cared about was film. You know, like, yeah. unfortunately, it's it, it's an obsession more than uh, a career. So I, I just bit the bullet and went to film school uh, locally and uh, got a degree in film studies. And while I was doing that, I, I continually was shooting short films with my friends, trying to just get any, you know, any kind of attention or experience. And um, uh, I think about a, almost a decade after I was in film school, I was like, it's time to make features. You know, I know what I want to do. I've kind of like figured out my tone, I think. Mm-hmm. So I wrote a, a zombie film, which I have yet to make, uh, which I like dying to make, which is, you know, you have those one or two projects that are in your top drawer of your shelf that you're like, is this ever going to happen? Yeah. Um, so I had that film and I was trying to get it made and I actually optioned it to a company uh, that saw something in it and me. And, but, but then I found out uh, a few months later that they were making a different zombie film mm. and I was furious, but 
uh, they, the producer said, this doesn't mean we're not going to do yours. It, in fact, this could actually be a great tee up and we want you to, um, come work on this film because I didn't have any, even IMDB credits at the mm-hmm. time. I, my biggest budget was a $500 short film, right. That I self financed. So, um, the plan was, I was going to be, uh, the director of that film's assistant and, um, mm-hmm. uh, study under him and maybe do second unit directing. And uh, then about two weeks out of the production happening, uh, that director had to step away from the film uh, as director because it was a telefilm uh, produced project, which is uh, in Canada, one of the bigger funding agencies. And one of their mandates is our directors have to be Canadian. Mm. And that director wasn't at the time. He was working on a citizenship, but it hadn't come through. So the producers had to either shut the movie down and risk it never happening or get a new director. And because I was in the wings and I was studying under him and I, he had me storyboarding the film for him. They were like, let's put you in. So yeah, that was my first film. It was like a very intense first film. Um, I learned a lot. It's called 13 Eerie. And um, it was, I won't lie. It was not necessarily always fun. It was like kind of brutal, um, but uh, I wouldn't take it away for the world because of what I learned um, on a film that wasn't something I wrote, you know, like every day was film class for me, like the most intense film class you can imagine to this day, one of the bigger budgets I've ever had and a great uh, cast of like, you know, Canadian actors and, you know, the most days I've ever had, li- big light cranes blowing stuff up. It was, it was great fun, but also like really hard. Wow. That's such a cool story. I mean, I feel like anybody else in that at, in in a scenario like that would have been like, "Ah, oh, no, no, I'm too good to be somebody's assistant." But lo and behold, you ended up directing that thing. I mean, that's that's so yeah. cool. And I feel like it's a testament to as a director, don't turn any opportunity down. You know, any opportunity to be on set, who knows what that can lead to? And in your case, clearly that paid off. Oh, a hundred percent. Like I. I that's whenever I, you know, uh, try and give anybody any kind of suggestions or advice when I talk at like a film school or something, it's like what you just said there is the thing, you know, like never turn anything down because I can tell you to this day, any opportunities I've had in my life, if you would have asked me six months prior, if it was going to happen or could be a possibility, it either, it either wasn't on my radar at all, or Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do it. So, um, you never know where the opportunity comes from or who's looking at you or who, right. You know what I mean? Like the, the zigzaggy road to getting anything done is um, unpredictable. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's the path in your head that you think you're going to take to be a director is rarely the actual path that manifests. It seems and just anything that can get you on a set or in front of people take that opportunity. All those who are listening. (laughs) Um, Is there anything us uh, American horror directors should know about filming in Canada as far as either grants or, I mean, clearly the production value in Saskatchewan is fantastic, but (laughs) anything, anything, and I seriously mean that it's really, it's beautiful. Um, Anything us American horror directors should know about uh, filming in Canada or any sort of film grants or programs or anything like that we should be aware of? Yeah, I mean, I think there there are great pockets of filmmakers and communities. And, uh, you know, I think there's like, you know, uh, Winnipeg had obviously Astron 6. And uh, I mean, there's a, the Fantasia Film Festival in Montreal is mm-hmm. a great festival. They have like a frontier market, which is a great place to kind of pitch your projects. But I mean, I think, you, you know, you, you can look at any province and there's going to be a little uh, groundswell of, of great indie filmmakers. And if you are looking to shoot something in Canada, I, I think I love it. You know, like I, yeah. yes, there is like uh, often the grants and financial things are for Canadian based projects. So you may want to, as a first step partner with a Canadian producer, if you're looking to make something in Canada. But uh, I think, I think the landscapes are beautiful. The people are great. And any province I've ever made a film in uh, the crews just like kick ass and they, they really work hard. And again, maybe that's partly the kinds of projects I, I do on a low budget film. Uh, people aren't there for the money. Yeah. Okay. Great. So I feel like one of the greatest honors a horror director can have is to have their movie on the last drive in with Joe Bob Briggs. It's also one of the greatest PR opportunities for any movie. How did Wolf cup find its way there? Did uh, Joe Bob select it himself? Did you pitch it? How did it end up on the last drive in? I could not tell you to this day. I don't know. Um, I, as a fan of Joe Bob, I didn't even know it was happening until wow. it had happened. I was actually at the theater being a Friday night, seeing a movie 
And uh, while I was in the theater, my phone kept vibrating to the point hmm. where I was like furious because it was ruining my movie experience. And then when I got out, I, I actually said, someone better have died. I don't know why the hell this is ringing so much. <laughs> and then I, I had like so many like kind texts and emails and on Twitter it was trending. And I was like, I, I had two reactions, like obviously immediate elation that uh, they would feature us. Second, it was like, like I was just so bummed I didn't watch it live. You know, yeah. I flew and that, but I've obviously watched it since. And um, I don't know, like, what can you say? It's just so uh, for a movie that was already a few years old to get the spotlight put on it and so many kind things said about it, you know, like I, I'm not going to say it's the reason you make stuff, but it m does make you feel a little less silly uh, years later for all the blood and sweat and tears you put into something called like Wolf Cop, you know? Yeah. 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 I feel like that's such an important point. And uh, I mean, before we started recording, you were talking about how going on the festival circuit, meeting other horror directors who go through, have to put all their blood, sweat and tears really it feels like a support group, you know, um, and how, and I feel like that that conveys a really important thing to, to, to directors out there, particularly in the horror genre who are doing projects that are outlandish and you're constantly questioning is that never really goes away. You know, you're questioning the validity of your movie, even after it's made, I'm sure. And then meeting other people who are doing equally outlandish things, you know, is helpful. And unfortunately we're in a time when a lot of, a lot of filmmakers have kind of been cheated out of their festival run, but um, have you had any way of being able to remain connected with your immediate community of filmmakers, either through social media or otherwise? Yeah, just social media. I mean, I think like, uh, you know, I'm often on Twitter or Instagram, just cheering other people on or looking at what they're doing or asking what their plans are, you know, and mm -hmm. sometimes just like asking their advice. Cool. Cool. So in the world of filmmaking and directing, uh, there's a lot of books on the topic. There's some that are way better than others. Um, but were there any really formidable resources or books that were helpful for you, either from a career perspective, a business perspective, or a creative perspective? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I mean, I, I've read books on pretty much every discipline. You know, like I, I read a book called On Directing uh, when I was about to direct my first film based on some advice I got, which did give me some good tips just in terms of dealing with actors and like kind of how to talk to actors. But I will say um, the actual experience of doing it is always so different <laughs> than what you get in a book, you know, because yeah. you realize pretty quickly actors are just human beings. And like, like you would never say, here's the one rule for talking to uh, every male and here's the one rule for talking to every female, you know? So it's right. like, you just get to know the people and, and listen to what they're saying, even if they're not speaking, you know, in dialogue, maybe they're just with how they're acting or their feelings. So um, yeah, I read on directing. I mean, um, I do a lot of writing probably more than directing. So I've read like uh, McKee's book on story. I've read uh, save the cat, which actually, you know, I don't agree with everything, but the discipline of the structure inspires me often, you know, yeah. like I, I like having parameters when I write, even if I'm like, well, I don't really think that has to happen every time. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I, I edit a lot too. So Walter Murch's uh, book on editing, I yeah, love that's that. That's a great one. Yeah, it's so good. So, so I mean, yeah, I, 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 I think there are great things out there. And yeah, whenever I'm going to step into a new role, I usually will read a couple books. Um, but sometimes biographies is as most interesting to me, like Peter Jackson's uh, autobiography or... Uh, Francis Ford oh, nice. Yeah, A really good one I just read is uh, Matthew McConaughey's Green Lights. Is, it's one of the oh, best I've weird. ever read. It's so good. I actually listened to it. I just I bought it, too. I bought the Does he narrate physical. it? He narrates it. Uh, now, it's, now I'm schooled already. Yeah, it's so enjoyable, and it's just it's surprisingly rewarding. You know, I've always been a big fan of his, but um, mm -hmm. it, 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 the whole thing blew me away. So many good lessons in there, and you know, and even filmmaking lessons as well. But yeah, it's it's a it's a fantastic listen and read. Yeah, and I always that save the cat's a pretty common recommendation. I always thought that somebody in the horror genre should make a book called kill the cat about building like <laughs> effective villains. Like what can you do yeah. on screen to make somebody hate a character? Like what's what are the, the obvious tropes that you shouldn't do? Because we all roll our eyes when we, even when we do them, we're like, Oh, you're going to do this. Actually, yeah. I thought of another good book. Um, the Duplass brothers wrote a book on, uh, on indie filmmaking. Yeah. And uh, I listened. It's funny when you mentioned listening to the audio book, I remembered that I actually listened to their audiobook where, uh, when I was on a road trip recently. And, um, 
it is so good. Um, I didn't know their backstory and their struggles with making films and films that they made that weren't necessarily, they were trying to be someone else. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, But there are, there are really good lessons in that book that I remember I actually wrote down and remind myself of from time to time. That's, I didn't even know they wrote a book. Yeah, it's great. And uh, like the, the biggest one, I'll just say one of the biggest things, because I think it's really valuable is um, every filmmaker and I'm guilty of this believes if they make something good enough, it'll get easier the next time. Mm -hmm. And there's someone out there who's going to scout you and pull you in and say, we've now solved all your problems. You know, whether you want to or not, you, you think if I just put this movie out and go to two festivals, this guy's going to pull up in a limo and say, here's your next film. Uh, And they say that um, that didn't happen for them. And they kept getting frustrated until they realized that like their term is the cavalry isn't coming. Oh yeah. I saw that speech on South by Southwest. Yeah. Yeah. They probably said that, uh, yeah, that might be a good mantra repeatedly to repeat because um, they said when they accepted that and they just looked inwardly at the other people, the people that show up for them over and over, Mm -hmm. uh, that's how they built their army. You know, they are their own army. And I find that very inspiring. Yeah. That's huge. That's really huge. Yeah, and to the point of every movie you make, it does, it's not going to get easier. Guillermo del Toro has a quote about how like making movies is eating a shit sandwich, and every movie you make, they give you a little more bread. You know, it never yeah. really gets. You're never really rid of all of your complications. You know, even it's if you're individual like that for level. me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can see that though. I mean, it it is very true. You know, like you always, you better love the idea because uh, you're definitely going to pay for it. Yeah. So in this quarantine uh, quarantine time period. Uh, a lot of people have had a lot of time on their hands. It's been great for creatives because it's just unbridled writing time, but also time to catch up on movies and shows and books and whatnot. Any recent uh, dis- great discoveries in terms of anything horror related as far as movies or TV? Um, I will say I'm watching a lot of Shudder. Um, that's been really fun for me. Like, you know, the uh, I you know just watched the Joe Bob Christmas marathon. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I, I just watched, uh, I think we referenced it earlier, but uh, I watched uh, Porno yesterday. That mm-hmm. was pretty fun. Yeah, that was and, a good one. Uh, yeah, no, I'm just like, I'm kind of all over the place. I'm watching a lot of drama, actually. I am uh, I I am trying to not beat myself up if I'm not too creative right now, because it is such a weird time uh, that's like, you know, just got to make money, too. You can't just be in your head the whole time being yeah. like, here's my opus. So, um, yeah, I'm kind of like juggling watching cool stuff, watching television, you know, like actually like ongoing series um, and writing, you know, writing is the thing that um, I would say I'm pouring myself into when I have that little bit of free time. I've got a couple horror scripts. I really want to crack, you yeah. know, that are, we're just idea phases pre pre COVID and uh, you know, trying to get into TV too. So working on some TV scripts. Very cool. What does your writing practice look like? Do you try to abide by any sort of a daily minimum, like a Stephen King, 2000 words or anything like that? Or I, you know, I can't do that. I, I, I always say I can, but um, I'm more of the, a person possessed uh, approach where um, I'll, I'll outline a lot. I'll outline and they'll reach a point where I'm just so impatient because I'm excited about the story that I just snap and start writing. And when I do that, um, I'm very, uh, I can write a lot, whether it's good or not. I don't know. I find out later usually, but um, I don't give myself page count goals because sometimes I just am so in my own head that I'll write like 30 pages in a day. So it's never, I'm never worried about, will I finish the script? I'm usually worried about like, do I have the outline right? Right, right. So you're, you structure before you start writing typically. Yeah. Because whenever I don't, it always bites me in the ass. Interesting. Well, Lowell, this was a whole lot of fun. What is next for you? Uh, I would love to know that myself. <laughs> I think like, uh, like many people in this, uh, weird, uncertain time, uh, you know, you're kind of just waiting for the, uh, green light to go out in the world again and, yeah. and do a few of the things you've been talking about. But, um, like I said, I, I'm developing TV. I have a couple pilot scripts that are in various stages of, uh, maybe, maybe not. And, uh, I've got a couple features that are also, uh, you know, ready to go if I can, get that last piece of financing or, uh, you know, just get the, the green light to go shoot it. Cool. Well, great. Well, thank you. Thank you again for joining us today. Any parting wisdom for those aspiring horror filmmakers out there? Um, the big one that we didn't touch on, uh, the only other one I can think of is just finish it. You know, mm. I think like that's, that's a cardinal sin that I, I have been guilty of, but really try not to, if you start something, finish it. 
Cool. Very wise words. Well, thank you again. Thank you, Nick. This was fun. All right, here as always are some key takeaways from this conversation with Lowell Dean. Number one, don't just come up with backup plans, communicate them. A lot of filmmakers talk about the importance of preparation and having backup plans, particularly Roger Corman. But what doesn't get discussed enough is the importance of communicating your backup plans to your cast and crew. On Wolf Cop 2, there was a very elaborate fight sequence that Lowell had originally budgeted four hours to shoot. But he told the stunt coordinator there was a chance they would only have 15 minutes to shoot it if the day got hectic. So to keep that in mind, of course, to make their day, Lowell ended up having to shoot the scene in 15 minutes. And because of their previous conversation, the stunt coordinator knew exactly what to do and they pulled it off pretty well. Movie making is to be constantly dancing with Murphy's Law. And the job of a director is to make your day in spite of your circumstances. So it's not only important to come up with plans A, B, C, and D, but to communicate them with everyone around you so that when the shit hits the fan, you can all correct course accordingly together without having to regroup and without anybody panicking, all of which costs precious production time. Number two. Be cognizant of who you ask for money. Not entirely sure if I agree with this 100%, but it's definitely something worth thinking about. When raising capital for his movies, Lowell avoids asking people in his immediate circle of friends for money to avoid any potential harm to the relationship. This might seem counterintuitive, but it's actually pretty smart. As you build your network as a filmmaker, you'll want to nourish it. And the quickest way to change your relationship is to ask somebody for money. Be conscious of that. Even if you have powerful and well-connected friends, asking them for funding will change the relationship and not always for the better. So instead of asking people in your immediate network for money, consider asking them for introductions to other people in their networks who might be able to fund your movie. This creates a level of separation which can keep your friendships intact. Number three, the path is never straight. So aim for exposure. Lowell told a really great story about pitching his zombie movie to a production company for a long, long time, only to find out that they were greenlighting somebody else's zombie movie. Lowell was given the opportunity to shadow the other director as his assistant. And rather than saying, fuck that, I'm too good for this, Lowell jumped at the opportunity and inevitably ended up directing that movie himself. Clearly, nobody could have predicted this, but Lowell had put himself in a position for experience and recognition, which is what you as a director must always be doing, particularly if you have zero IMDb credits. Whatever will get you on set and in front of producers is where you need to be going. So even if it feels beneath you, take every opportunity because the path you have in your mind for becoming a director is rarely the one that will work out. So jump at any opportunity that offers experience, education, exposure, recognition, or just proximity to real sets and real filmmakers. Anyway, guys, thank you as always for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, why not share it with your friends and family on social media? Don't forget to follow the show on Instagram at I am Nick Taylor. That's I am Nick Taylor. And on Twitter at the same handle. Thanks again for listening to the Nick Taylor Horror Show. 